Hi everyone, I'm Laura with the World Science Festival. Thanks so much for joining us with our chat today. We are talking with Danny Adams about our program Forever Young, and we're going to be talking about the promise of human regeneration. Danny, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about who you are and what you do and where you work? Uh, I am Dr. Danny Spencer Adams. I'm a research professor at Tufts University, and I'm part of a center called the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. Great. And so our first question today comes from our user, Out of Outer Space, who asks, how does the body create bioelectricity? It's a great place to start. Um, the, I think the easiest way to imagine it is to go back and think about cells evolving from primitive, or primitive or from just from the chemicals in the primordial soup. And the first thing you need to imagine is a bubble. And the bubble represents the plasma membrane of cells. So it's the oily layer that defines the edges of cells. And it's important that it's oily because the stuff inside is watery and the stuff outside is watery. So by having a, a, an oily layer, you have a barrier that separates the inside from the outside. Now take your oily bubble and fill the inside of it with lots and lots of positive charges. And now, if you look, if you zoom in and look at that membrane, you'll see a difference in charge. Um, they'll be much more positive on the inside and much more negative on the outside, simply because you've loaded up all those positive charges. And because they have charge, they can't get through that oily layer, so they're, so they're stuck. So now you're going to involve things called channels. And channels are proteins. And they are exactly what they sound like. They're like little tubes that go through that oily layer and make a watery channel. And as soon as you have an opening like that, those potassium charges, uh, all those potassiums that are charged, are going to uh, just pour out of that cell because there's so many more on the inside and so few on the outside. Now you close that channel. So you don't let those things out and again, we're going to zoom in and look at that oily, bubbly plasma membrane layer. And what you can see is that it's positive on the outside and negative on, sorry, positive on the inside, negative on the outside. And now what I want you to do is superimpose a battery. So now instead of having that little tunnel, I want you to just have a battery sticking through there. And if you think about what a battery is, it has a positive end and a negative end. And if you connect those two ends, uh, electricity can flow. So you put a wire and you can have electricity flowing. Well, it's exactly the same thing in the plasma membrane. You open that channel and ions can flow and that's a current. So that's electricity. So the way the body is creating electricity is by separating charges, by having cells that can build up in, in a lot of potassium on the inside and more than there is on the outside. So it's that process of separating charge, and it depends entirely on that oily container layer. That's a great foundation to get us started for this chat. Um, so our next question is, is it possible to grow a human or mammal brain in the lab? Um, okay, there's two possible ways to interpret that question. One is, can you take a brain out of a human or an animal and stick it in a dish and keep it alive. And the other one is, can you start with cells that are kind of generic and cause them to create a brain uh, in the dish? Uh, the answer to the first one is, I think, probably yes. Um, it probably won't behave normally, um, but I think it's certainly possible to keep it alive, to, to create the right environment. Um, now, the other one, which is more interesting, and I think what the question is really about, is a little more, uh, a little more difficult to answer. The short answer is, I personally cannot do that, no. Um, but I think that one of the things that's important that we talked about, actually, at the World Science Festival is that while we're very good at taking cells and putting them in dishes and having them grow, we're very bad at having them grow into the correct shape. Um, we really don't know how things like a brain 
the brain starts out as the front end of a tube and it kind of swells and it bulges and then it gets bigger and bigger and it starts to make folds. We don't know how to make cells do that. Um, so in that sense, no, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we can uh, force, if you will, or, or coax cells into making an actual brain because I don't think we know yet uh, even something as simple as how to make it make a brain shape. Um, what, so, so my work and the work um, in, at the center has to do with trying to understand how these electrical signals might help us. Can we help us create the right shape? Can we convince the cells or coax the cells or talk to the cells and tell them you're going to be brain. Can you and tell them, of course, in quotes, um, you you know, develop, divide, proliferate, make all the cells of a brain, and come out the right shape. And we are hoping that, and and we have some evidence that these electrical signals are capable of sending that entire message. But we haven't gotten there yet. We're still we're still much much further back. Can we make it, you know, make a, a blob versus make a sphere? We're really we're still pretty much learn, trying to learn that language, learn the bioelectric language, so that we know how to send the signal to the cells that will trigger them. The fancy word is induce. That will induce them to make something that's the right shape as well as uh, the right size and all the other things that you need to make an organ. So back to the short answer, no, we can't do that yet. Maybe one day. So, so in our program, you mentioned something called optogenetics. Um, our user, Richard Alpert, asks, can optogenetics direct and shape the development of individual stem cells? So maybe you could start with just a quick overview of what um, optogenetics is. So optogenetics. <laughs> Excuse me. Optogenetics is um, it's enormously cool. It's a um, it's a technique that uh, we borrowed from from single celled algae. Actually, uh, some very smart people real realized that um, in the single celled algae uh, there are these channels. So I talked to you before about channels and opening pathways through the layer. And those, there are channels in these blue-green algae that open and close depending on the color light shining on them. So they're light-controlled pathways that can generate current. So what these very smart people did was they took the gene for those light-controlled channels, and they learned that you can stick them into uh, pretty much any kind of cell you want. Um, and then what you've done is you've given yourself a tool that you can use to control whether those channels are open. So you can control whether there's a current. If there's a current, the voltage dissipates. You can control all that simply by turning lights on and off. Uh, it's really it's enormously cool and enormously clever. And neuroscientists are doing fantastic things with these in brains. You can find those online. Um, we have been trying to um, use those as a way to uh, get the message across to the cells electrically of what we want them to do. And of course, at this point, we're still figuring out, well, if we do this, what will they do? And then later on, we'll claim we learned how to control it, but really we just figured out what they, what they do normally. So here we have this tool and you can put them into pretty much any cell you want. DNA is very, very stable, um, and you can do things like um, that when you when you ask another lab for the gene for something, they literally take it and they put the DNA on a piece of paper, and they stick that piece of paper in the mail to you, and it comes in the mail, and you open it up, and you have your DNA that you've asked for. So there's a number of different ways, but basically you can get it into cells in a variety of ways. And once those cells have those channels, those light-activated channels present, 
then we can control the voltage by turning on and off the lights. So the question is, can you use a technique like that? Can we put those light activated channels into stem cells and use light to, to induce them to become one particular type of cell uh, versus another particular type of cell? I, I believe I've got the question right. Yes. Um, yeah, if we could shape you know, individual stem cells using this technology. Right. OK. So the other thing, for those of you who don't know, stem cells are very special cells that stay kind of less developed than the other cells in your body. So your muscles, for example, have muscle stem cells. And they're all distributed throughout your muscles, but they're not muscles. They're pre-muscles. And if you have damage to a muscle, what happens is the stem cell starts to divide and make more and more and more of itself. Um, and some of those cells stay stem cells. They stay in this sort of um, ready to go when signaled state. The others go on and become new muscle. So the question is, can we use this optogenetic technique to control, is the cell staying a stem cell or is it becoming a muscle cell? Can we use this to make them turn into muscles exactly the time we want them to. Um, and I think the answer is absolutely. Um, the, I know that it's a little easier even than that. We have colleagues who, if you take stem cells and grow them in a dish, you can change their voltage. Partly, you can, you can do it in all sorts of fancy ways, but you can also just change the ions that are on the outside. So remember when I said that you, the cells generate uh, electricity by separating charge, by putting more, say, potassium ions inside the cell than there are outside. So if you come in as a scientist and you dump a whole load of potassium ions on the outside, you've changed the difference in charge. You've changed what the relationship is of the inside to the outside. And just doing that can actually cause stem cells to go in a particular direction. So, and I'm, I'm not remembering the details exactly, but this is from a lab uh, run by David Kaplan. And uh, in particular, a uh, postdoc of his, Sarah Sandela Cruz, uh, discovered that you could take these uh, stem cells that in the body could make fat or they could make, I believe it was bone. And by changing the potassium concentration outside the cells to different levels, she was able to make them become fat when she wanted them to become fat, and bone when she wanted them to become bone. So because we have this evidence that it might actually even be that simple to do it, um, that's why that's, that's the basis of my answer that, yes, absolutely, optogenetics uh, could certainly be used to do it. The trick would be, how do you get the gene into the stem cells? Uh, you have to for now, the only way we know how to do that is to take them out of the body and do it in the dish. Um, I don't, I can't offhand think of any theoretical reason why you couldn't then put them back in the body uh, and then, you know, get your little flashlight into where they are and, and trigger them to take a particular developmental path to the kind of cell that you wanted. And our next question comes from our user, Go Beyond, who asks, how close are we to being able to grow an artificial pancreas to help treat diabetics? Uh, um, I, I don't know that answer. I'm not in the pancreas field. Um, a pancreas is, it is a very, very complicated organ. Any organ is actually a collection of lots of different types of cells. So. We might be able to, for example, um, isolate uh, the cells, I believe they're called the Isles of Langerhans, uh, special cells, uh, and grow up some of those. I, if we have that going, and I'm sure people are trying, um, I would expect that what we haven't figured out yet is how to trigger them to make all the right different kinds of cells and then organize themselves into a pancreas. Um, but that's my guess. I'm not in that field. Um, that's, that's what I would guess is about where we are. 
And our next question comes from our viewer, uh, Pintu Chakra Bortol. Apologies for saying your name wrong. <laughs> um, will it be possible to make body parts in 3D software and then print them? Um, so I yes, uh, I believe that is, it's absolutely going on right now. So um, the other people on the panel actually are doing that kind of thing. So I mentioned that one of the difficult things that we don't understand is how to make things in the right shapes. And so by 3D printing, what you can do is you can make the shape in advance and then have the cells fill it in. So what you're actually 3D printing is not the organ, it's kind of a scaffold for the cells to grow into and then create their own um, natural type scaffold. And usually those scaffolds are biodegradable. So once the cells have taken on that shape and they kind of take over and they get rid of the scaffolding. So that's a, um, it's an incredibly clever way to go about getting a tube, if what you need is a tube. Um, or, uh, you know, if what you need is a, a flat sheet, you can just 3D print a flat sheet scaffold. There's two... I want to make two comments about that. Um, one is that it's not, you have to do it with a person's own cells in order for the body to then accept that being transplanted into it. And you don't want the immune system to reject the, the, uh, the organ that you've so carefully grown. Um, I think that we have a way to go, <coughs> excuse me, uh, figuring out how to make that happen. So do we have to seed these scaffolds with cells that come from the patient? Or can we make cells that will um, not express or not put onto their surfaces the proteins that will trigger the immune response? Um, that's one thing we have to think about. <coughs> Another thing is that organs, um, you can't just <clears throat> put an organ in and expect it'll work. It has to uh, have a uh, blood circulatory system. It has to have nerves come into it to make it work. It has to become integrated in very profound ways uh, with, the <clears throat> with the body where it has been put. I know people are trying to learn how to do that. I don't believe that's been successful yet. One approach is to, uh, while it's still in the dish, make nerves grow into it and make uh, uh, blood vessels grow into it so that it comes as a, as a complete package. Um, and people are working on doing that and how can you make that happen? Um, the second thing I want to say about that is that as cool as that is, and it is really cool, um, I think there's probably a better way to go. And that is to, to do it inside the person's body. So rather than create the whole thing outside and then try to make it fit in the right place, go in and, and, and learn how to, so say for example a kneecap, you're trying to uh, uh, make a knee. You can make it outside and put all these things into it and, and put it in, or you can go into the person's leg and, and signal the cells around it to regenerate that organ. That is closer to the kind of thing that I do in frogs, where I, so you say you cut off the the tail of a frog and you if you make it pump ions out so if you open up all these channels and and positive ions come flowing out what will happen is the tail will regenerate all on its own and it'll come out the right shape and it comes out with all the right tissues and it stops at the right time and it's all integrated its nervous system is integrated and its uh, circulatory system is integrated it's, it's a way of um, triggering the body to regenerate itself rather than trying to create 
something outside and ask the body to accept it. So um, these, these tissue printing processes, uh, which I expect will become you know, useful very soon, um, they're not exactly regeneration. They are making an organ and then sticking it in and asking it to be accepted. So it's a different set of questions. Um, but I think that, that what's really exciting is that these electrical signals seem to be like the master switch. Um, if you change that of the electrical signal, everything happens afterwards and all the regulation gets turned on. Um, so I think that eventually that's going to be a better place to go um, because it will come out the right shape and it will come out integrated. And you'll get all the different cell types you need, and your stem cells will do the right things. So that's that's my dream of how where regenerative medicine is going. This next topic, I think, came up towards the end, the very end of our program. Um, the question comes from Darth Yoda one two three, who asks, um, "Is it really possible to bring back a species like Jurassic Park, or was that just complete fiction?" No, absolutely, it's possible. Um, it depends. So I was saying before that DNA is very very stable and uh, which is why if you can find a blood sample for example in a mosquito that's been preserved in am amber you actually can get the DNA out of it what you don't get is all of the DNA perfectly preserved so for example um, with a woolly mammoth we have some of the DNA and what they do is actually you, you incorporate that mammoth DNA into elephant DNA, a very, very close relative or, you know, even a descendant, but something that's, that's evolutionarily very close. And you kind of cross your fingers and you hope that whatever didn't come with the mammoth DNA, the elephant DNA will supply, and you hope that whatever is different whatever made the mammoth different from the elephant is represented in the DNA that you found in the mosquito. Uh, and that's actually how they're going about uh, trying to do that. Uh, so it requires having a closely related species that you can then, you know, you, you do your molecular biology magic and you put it into the egg and then you let an elephant uh, gestate and carry it to term. And you keep your fingers crossed, but absolutely it's possible. Well, I look forward to my uh, pet velociraptor. I'm excited about that one. <laughs> um, so our next question is from Ark Molin, who asks, besides organs and limbs, would it be possible to grow back teeth or hair? Uh, that is an, actually an active area of research. Um, dentistry is often uh, kind of ahead of the curve as far as trying these new things. And uh, in fact, um, Harvard Dental School is at this very moment advertising for a researcher who's interested in uh, regeneration uh, of teeth and, and jaw and bone and all that. Um, so yes, again, absolutely, as long as we can create the right environment and we can signal the cells regenerate, you know, pretend you're developing a jaw for the first time. Um, and and, and we hope that what will happen is that uh, the jaw will regenerate and part of it will, you'll get the little, what they're called tooth buds, tooth teeth grow from these little um, tooth buds. And if we can figure out the right message, then absolutely, the uh, future of dentistry is absolutely going to be, it, that's, that's going to be involved for sure. And our next question comes from D4V3Y, who asks, is there any representation of developmental biology in movies or fiction that's a particular pet peeve of yours and how it's just completely impossible? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of, so the, the, there's a movie coming to mind. It was Jeff Bridges. It was called Starman. Um, there, I, have, I have two answers to that. One is Starman. And he, he goes through all the steps of, of development in about five minutes. He, he looks at, he comes in as an alien, and he, and he finds a, a book of photographs. And so he, 
he's able to instantly figure out that the baby comes first and then the toddler and then and so he turns himself into a baby and then he gradually grows to toddler to human to whatever and i think that if you're a shapeshifter you can go straight to human you, you don't have to do that and you, it certainly can't happen that quickly um, or outside of a uterus um, my bigger pet peeve is the idea that cloning uh, is the same thing um, that you can, you know, clone yourself. Um, of course, you can't. If you if you wanted to clone yourself, what you would end up doing is your DNA would go into an egg, and that would have to go through gestation and development and all the things that aren't determined genetically would be different. And what actually would then be born nine months later would be your identical twin sibling. Um, it wouldn't be you. And I think the, um, that that fallacy that you can clone something, you can clone yourself and it'll be just like you, or you can clone a beloved pet and you will get that pet back, um, I think that's very deceptive. Um, uh, development. People haven't really, or I don't go to the movies enough, um, I haven't seen that really distorted. Uh, I think because in humans, and those are usually the subjects, it takes place internally, and so I think it's probably hard, very hard to dramatize that. Um, I like that question, though. I'm going to be thinking about that for days. Well, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think those are some good, some good responses. So, um, Our next question, I apologize to this person. I do not know how to say your username. But the question is, can you use stem cells and guide them to generate neuron cells, like we talked about earlier, perhaps, um, to enhance certain regions of the brain? Uh, we can do it in the dish. Um, it's very, very difficult to take something from a research bench uh, into actually into a human. Um, but yes, we can make neurons in the dish, we can take stem cells and use uh, bioelectric signals uh, and trigger them to become neurons. Again, I think even if we can do that, even if we can make, for example, excuse me, dopaminergic neurons that can go into substantia nigra and treat Parkinson's, even if we can grow exactly the right neurons and exactly the right number and have them be exactly the right shape, there's still this problem of getting them to be integrated with the rest of the brain, getting the brain to treat them uh, so that, they'll, that that will happen. So again, I think that eventually what we are going to want to do, the real... Um, the real end goal should be learning how to do that. It's called in vivo, inside a brain. Go in there and either put in the DNA for um, uh, what are these optogenetic channels, or you know we're learning more about the genetics of how to make a cell become a stem cell become a particular neuron. Um, if we can figure out how to go in and have the cells that are already there regenerate on their own. I think that's going to be the cleanest way to do it. You don't have to deal about immune problems. You don't have to deal with um, uh, shape. You don't have to deal with all these things. You simply give the message, do this. So I think that's going to be cleaner. Uh, but the short answer is, yes, I'm sure we'll be able to do that. I know we can already do it in the dish. And our listener, Alex K, asks, is there any way to grow biomechanical things? For example, in theory, could you grow some biological thing that works like a car? I, I'm, a car is very complicated, so I'm trying to actually think of a simpler machine. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat that question as, can we uh, grow a, a biological machine? And what I will tell you is that that has also already been done. So there are these, um, there's a group at MIT, it's called EBIX. And part of that group has made these, they're, they're using human cells, or maybe not human, but animal cells 
as what are called actuators. Um, and they're, they're combining them with particular materials and using the cells to generate forces. So they take, so the, the, there's a beautiful thing. I would go ahead and look online for the, um, there's a jellyfish. And it's a, it really, it moves like a jellyfish and, and it's just a piece of something rubbery that has muscle cells growing on it. And those muscle cells um, are coordinated and, and working together and you can actually get, it, it really does move like a jellyfish. So from there to having something that's in, entirely uh, cellular or, or biological in origin, um, I think it's not a far leap. Um, but we're, we're, that's another really interesting idea that people are actually pursuing already. So it sounds like the scientists are way ahead of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> what they've got. <laughs> so this question comes from Greg Stewart, who asks, do you think it's worthwhile to keep DNA from a younger version of yourself, you know, like in your hair clippings, in the hope of um, one day in the future being able to repair our DNA to stay young from the sample? I can't hurt. Um, uh, I think probably most of you know that um, that there are that the that the blood that's found in the uh, umbilical cord uh, is considered very yummy and young and full of all sorts of lovely things. And there are uh, cord blood banks now. So again, this is something that people think you know this could be potentially really really useful. Um, one of the things about um, aging and its senescence um, has to do with what happens to the DNA. I think that's probably where this question comes from. And one of the things is that uh, when DNA is replicating itself, so your cells are getting ready to divide, so you, you have to double the, the amount of DNA you have, you copy all of your chromosomes. Um, but because of the, the structure of the molecule, of the DNA molecule, it actually gets a little shorter at the end every time it gets replicated. So over the maybe, I think it's something like 80 times maybe that, that any individual DNA molecule gets replicated in your body, it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And the little pieces that are getting cut off um, are called telomeres. Tela just means end and mere means body. So the telomeres are getting shorter as you get older. So one idea is if you save young DNA, and again, it's so easy. You just put it in the freezer, basically, or you dab it onto a piece of paper. If you save the young DNA that has those long telomeres, maybe we could use that to uh, replace or repair these cells as they get older. Um, I think I, it's certainly worthwhile saving some baby hair. Um, teeth is another good thing to say. Teeth always have lots of uh, interesting cells in them. Um, I don't know if we have learned actually how to use those young cells as some kind of template to fix our older cells. Uh, I, yeah, it's, it's not my field. I don't. I don't know. It's a it's a nice idea, and I expect someone is thinking about it. Um, and it theoretically is possible. Um, it might be better to save entire cells rather than just the DNA, because it's easier to to replace old cells with young cells than it is to replace old DNA with young DNA. And I think this. And I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please finish. Oh, I'm done. Oh, oh, okay, great. Um, so our next question is from Out of Outer Space, who asks, how similar or different is the growth pattern of a frog leg to the human leg? Do they grow in the same way during early development? Uh, yes, they do. Um, so they're, uh, I believe you're talking about the long bones. Um, and they, uh, indeed, they do grow in the same way, uh, which is why uh, uh, Dr. Celia Herrera Rincon, which, who's in Mike Levin's lab, was also part of the group here at Tufts, um, is using frog legs and to figure out uh, how to how to 
talk to them and tell them to regenerate. Um, and we can, it's, it's fairly simple to extrapolate and make predictions about human because they do indeed grow in the same way. Ol55 Ya asks, um, living forever sounds amazing, but does our brain have the capacity to cope with this experience? Wow, that, uh, um, on a psychological level, I guess, no. Um, this is the, I will tell you that what's going through my head as my resource is uh, the Anne Rice vampire books. Um, thinking about the difficulties of living forever. Um, and, you know, we are, we are programmed to die may not be the right way to put it, but um, uh, it's certainly in our, in our makeup uh, that we will not live forever. And so whether our brains are capable of, of dealing with not being afraid of death, um, uh, it's, yeah, I think that's, that's another feel. It's certainly above my head. Um, I will say that uh, humans who live longer have no particular trouble relative to people who, who live shorter amounts of time. So there certainly is some plasticity in, uh, in our ability to deal with uh, life of a given length. So it might be able to, we might be able to push ourselves. I think we'd be very different. Sorry, I think we'd be very different because I think knowing we die is knowing we're going to die, whether we believe it or not. Uh, I think that that is an interesting part of being human. So I think that if that wasn't there, um, I think we'd be very, very different. Um, and our next question comes from Stephen Cross. Uh, can you speculate on the time frame that we might be talking about before this kind of human immortality is feasible with these techniques? You know, a rough estimate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think the biggest delay will certainly be getting permission to try it. Um, wow. I would love to say 25 years because I'll probably still be alive then, but I would guess that it's going to be more like 50. Um, I don't think this generation, my generation, um, is going to be able to benefit from that. Um, but possibly the next generation, um, uh, you know, kids in high school now might very well reach a point when they get older when they will be given an option of extending their life using some of these techniques. I hope so. I hope so. I, I think um, the reason that I'm um, optimistic about that is, and again, I'm thinking both about this, the, the ability that we're getting to, tish, you know, to um, 3D print a scaffold and create the tissue um, and implant it, um, but also about our ability to learn how to tell the cells to do it. Um, I really do believe it's going to be an electrical message. And the, I think that this electrical, these electrical approaches, these bioelectrical approaches are going to be easier to translate, so easier to put into a clinic than other things because we already have so many medicines and we know so many chemicals um, because of psychiatry and because of um, you know gastroenterology. So we we already have mechanisms for changing the electri electrical situation um, that are already approved for use in humans. So. Um, making the tadpole tail regenerate um, required just having it pump some hydrogen ions out. Well, we have all sorts of uh, drugs that can, can make you do that. Um, actually, well, what we have is drugs that will stop that from happening. So if you've ever taken Prilosec or um, any of the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors, those are drugs that have been, what they're doing is they're changing the currents that are coming out of the cells in your stomach. They're stopping a hydrogen current. They're closing the channels. They're turning off the pumps. Um, so we have all of these 
drugs already. And if it turns out it is as simple as, you know, change the voltage across the membrane, change the distribution of potassium ions on the inside relative to the outside, uh, we're very close to being able to do that um, uh, without having to worry about side effects or new side effects. So I think I, I'm a little, I'm probably overly optimistic, um, but I think it will be faster than, for example, gene therapy, um, because we, we know so little about what happens when you put in a new gene and you change the genetic makeup of the cells. Um, and uh, some of the gene therapy trials have not worked at all. So, uh, but we already know what happens when you take Prilosec, so. We've got, we've got time for just a few more questions. This one comes from Captain Falcon Almighty. Do you think genetic research in humans will eventually go from mostly medicine and disease to altering humans? Uh, on some level, medicine is altering humans. Um, but I have a, a lot of faith in scientists. Um, I don't think that you're going to find it, you know, that suddenly everybody's going to be giving birth to uh, superhuman babies. I don't think that scientists are interested in that. I don't think um, hum most humans are interested in that. I think that, um, you know, there's very funny movies. Here's something that drives me crazy about movies is that um, a lot of scientists are portrayed as being, having very odd motivations. Um, scientists really aren't paid very much. Um, it's, we don't, there's, there's rarely a financial incentive to learn where, where most of us are, are motivated by curiosity and just how cool it is. I mean, how cool is that? I made a tail regenerate by shining a light on it. I mean, it's really, it's a very different motivation from the motivations that are, are you find in literature or movies. Um, so I'd be very surprised if some mad scientist um, was born who wanted to change humans genetically. The other reason I don't think it's, it's really likely is because um, to change a human, you either have to get to the egg where you can put in a new gene, um, or you have to find a way to deliver a gene to every single one of the 10 to the 23 cells in the human body. And that just, you can't do it. There's just no way to do it. Um, uh, people are looking at uh, viruses because that's what viruses are very good at. Viruses attack your body and they put their DNA into your cells. Um, but you would need quite an army of viruses to actually change enough the cells to change an already uh, hatched or an already born person. Um, so I think it's much more likely that uh, that using it for therapy, for medicine, uh, is is that's what's coming down the pike. I don't think people are looking into trying to create humans with you know superpowers or. Or even just uh, something nice. I would, I would love to have a tail, or wings. Um, I don't think that's that's in the in the cards. Um, so our user Achilles three hundred eight asks: Is there something we can learn from the tardigrade or other extremophiles oh, for our senior generation? Oh, I love that question. Um, I love tardigrades. I love extremophiles. So for people who don't know, um, extremophiles are animals that live in what we consider to be very extreme environments. So the things, uh, the animals that live at the uh, vents at the bottom of the ocean where it's incredibly hot, um, or uh, uh, there are bacteria that live in hot springs, um, and tardigrades are wonderful. They, they live in moss and soil and stuff, and, and they can completely dry out and be fine. And as soon as they get wet again, they just, pop back, they become reanimated by water. Um, and I absolutely think that we have a lot to learn from that. Um, not necessarily because we're going to, uh, we want to create 
humans that can be completely dried out and then come back to life. But because of what they have to teach us or, you know, there's, there's some pretty clever things going on there that allow that to happen. Um, the presence of water is basically the, the fundamental thing you need for life. So to be ability to, to dry out and hold on to just enough water that, that you can come back, um, that's a really interesting and potentially useful ability. So if we study those things, uh, maybe we can learn something about, not necessarily something that humans can already do, but maybe we can learn something that we can use to help humans in another situation. So, um, I mean, I think one of the one of the um, one of the things I'm sorry about about science education is there aren't enough people to understand why looking at things other than humans is useful for humans. Um, you. You can learn things about humans, but you can also learn new things that we can then use uh, in further research, um, but also that we can learn, you know, how to do these new things and deal with extreme environments. Um, tardigrades are probably going to tell us a lot about how to go into space and live in space for a long time. Um, there is a bacterium that was found in uh, uh, hot springs, and we use it now. It's, it's, what we learned from it was how to replicate DNA at high temperatures. So if our DNA, if you take our DNA and you heat it up too high, the two strands of it simply fall apart, and you kind of kill it. But there are these bugs um, that, uh, these bacteria that live in hot vents that can replicate their DNA at very high temperatures. And uh, Carrie Mullins, uh, who invented this PCR, which is, um, it's now, it's like having a pH meter. Everybody has a PCR machine. It's for replicating lots and lots and lots of copies of DNA that you're studying. And they use... They, they, they can do it now in the lab because they learned how that bacterium does it. We actually borrow the gene from that bacterium. So studying extremophiles gives us information that we can use. Um, uh, and it's, and so it's, it's very, very important, even though it's not necessarily learning something about being human. And I, I wish that would make it into, into the movies that people um, could, could understand how important extremophiles are. Great note to end on. Um, so thank you so much, Danny, for uh, answering all our questions today. My pleasure. They were great. Yeah, thank you so much to our viewers for joining us and for your fantastic questions. And please come back next time where we'll be talking about our program, Cartographers of the Brain, Mapping the Connectome. Goodbye, everybody.